Well, uh, welcome to uh, uh, our sixth Myers Lecture recipient, and this is, I think, the fourth time we've actually done the interview with the uh, lecturer, and so we're uh, delighted to have you with us. It's a privilege to have you here and honor us as part of the, uh, you honor us with your presence, and we honor you as part of the Myers Lecture Series. You know, as I had the chance to learn a little bit more about you in preparation for today, um, there is a boatload of significant accomplishments uh, in your career. And, you know, to me, we start with the fact you've been in private practice for more than 50 years. You've been affiliated with four different academic institutions. You've given over 500 lectures. You've got over 100 referee publications, 50 U.S. patents. I mean, most of us be happy to have one, let alone 50 of them. Uh, and 10 of those have led to products that went into the marketplace. Uh, you were the first to describe several clinical conditions, fibromian gland dysfunction, central corneal clouding as a result of PMMA lens wear, GPC, and noting that mybomian duct obstruction was a primary cause of dry eye. Uh, you founded or co-founded five research companies dating back to 1970. You developed the CSI contact lens, which was the framework and the basis for all, virtually all contact lenses since then. You're first to develop topical dry eye products that include a lipid component, which obviously includes Sustained Balance and Soothe XP. And you were even a pioneer in the area of bioptic driving vision. And uh, all this, while being in private practice, which to me is just an amazing accomplishment. Obviously a, a tremendous number of recognitions. Um, Inventors Award from the National Inventors Hall of Fame, Founders Award from the Contact Lens and Cornea Section of the Academy, the Rubin Research Medal from the International Society for Contact Lens Research, the namesake and the first recipient of the Corp Medal from American Optometric Association, a BCLA Medal from the British Contact Lens Association, member of the National Optometry Hall of Fame, and honorary degrees from the New England College of Optometry, your alma mater, and the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. And that's, that's all pretty impressive stuff, you know. And, uh, most of us would say any one of those things would be pretty cool to have, but to have all of that is uh, just an amazing thing. But I'm really more interested in what kind of makes Don Corp tick and what, what motivates you and what, what, what are you striving to do. So with that, we've got a series of questions and we're gonna see how that opens up some thoughts and considerations here. So there seems to be a tremendous amount of scientific <coughs> curiosity in your life. Where does that come from and what motivates you to do the, the clinical research that you do? Well, probably my curiosity is genetic. Okay. In that I was very fortunate to have parents who were intellectually curious. My father was a, uh, in his youth, was a very renowned medical researcher in new strains of viruses at Rockefeller Institute. And I grew up in a culture of always, I grew up in a culture where knowledge and research was respected, although my father never did research when she started clinical practice because of the Great Depression and so many other problems at that time. So I imagine that uh, my major accomplishment was 90 days before conception, having the discipline to do certain genes well. And for that, I'm grateful. Um, so that would be my response. Relative to uh, why I became interested in, in research, it probably was a combination of being basically unhappy, I imagine, and always trying to focus on something that would keep me busy so I wouldn't be as unhappy. It was probably uh, much more economically viable for me in those days than seeing a psychiatrist. <laughs> so, so it was just, it was just, it was just, just exciting. It was just something to do. And I was very, very fortunate early in my career to uh, have been in Boston. I think that being in Boston was just an unbelievable advantage. And I was surrounded by, no matter where you went, there was somebody who was innately smarter than you were. No matter where you went, there was always somebody who was more encyclopedic. encyclopedic it's like yeah, we know what you're right, than, than you were. And uh, I think that was just, and no matter where you went, there was always an opportunity to work in somebody's lab or to team up with somebody to collaborate. 
And then, of course, we had the Scape Inside Research Institute in Boston, in addition to all the other very strong visual programs. I mean, even Northeastern University in those days had a very, very strong uh, program in vision science where John Armstrong and Kevin was really, really quite remarkable. So I think it was just a combination of factors that started to propel me along the line uh, to see cancers. And then, of course, when I came into the field, the field was just really developing. Uh, it was not as sophisticated as it is now. And a lot of the basic observations really have not been made. So you can ask a question, and the answer and the response that you received was so really weak that it almost propelled you to think that you could do better. Uh, I remember when I was asking about the concept of the doing of the coin. We were just chatting about that before we met with you. And I remember that there was a, a, uh, a rather large book on the coin by Thomas, and he described a series of experiments where an individual uh, investigator uh, cut off all the lumbar vessels to see if, if, I think they call that a parotomy. It's been so long since I've thought about it. They cut off all the lumbar vessels 360 degrees around the corner to see if that would change this phenomenon of having these little micro cysts, which or edema in the periphery of the corner called the lumen. When you think of how rudimentary that was, it was it was really a it was really a great opportunity and a great time to to find the answers in a rather easy manner. So I think that would be powerful. So as, as you came into the profession, clearly, you know, you could have spent your time researching almost anything. You know, you spent some time in the low vision area. It uh, could have been in spectacle lenses. It could have been, you know, in the areas of disease. Why contact lenses and why dry eye, meibomian gland dysfunction? How did, why was it that area rather than some of these other areas that could have been easy areas of interest for you? Well, contact lenses started uh, by design rather than by default. And that, that was really the exciting year. If you go back to the, to, the, uh, to the early 60s, and if you go back to, to that era, um, you know, Kevin Tuohy was just, Tuohy, who invented the corneal lens, was 1951 or 52, I think. So by the 60s, nothing had been around very long. It was really, really, really new. And there was no science. There was really no science behind it. Uh, although at Columbia, they were doing some interesting work on oxygen. Uh, Smezola uh, was there. And then uh, a whole group of OGs, including Brad for a while, and other individuals who were students at Columbia, who worked with him in his lab and, and learned about it. But there really wasn't much, there really wasn't much, much knowledge about uh, about how a contact lens created edema and what, what its limitations were and how you would overcome that. So I actually succeeded my professor uh, at the College of Pharmacy who taught contact lenses. He started in the late 50s teaching them, but little he did know. Uh, but he was a good mechanic. He could really fit a contact lens very, very, very well. And the question was, how do you take that and make it better? So he had his own ways, and when I came with him, that really was a great stimulus because all of a sudden I had a lot of contact lens patients who, uh, who could wear lenses and more contact lens patients who could not wear contact lenses. And one of the early observations that I made being with him was he was very meticulous, and he would start fitting people a little bit steeper than flat K, just a little bit steeper than flat K. And they'd have the patients wear the lenses four hours, and then they'd have them back and take their K reading. And if the K reading steepened, then he'd adjust the lens. And he usually cut the diameter two tenths, sometimes three tenths, and adjust the peripheral curves. Have the patient come back again wearing four or five hours, and then meticulously measure the corneal uh, shape. And he wanted the corneal shape not increase in 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 curvature. And that's how Fred Farnham fitted contact lenses. Well, I made the observation that the positioning of the lens changed 
and it almost can vary with when you fit it in as they roll below. But as he went through this process and the patient became successful, the lenses started to find gravity. They moved up on the corner. And I thought to myself, hmm, that's interesting. So in observing it one day, I said, I'm going to chart this. So I charted what percentage of individuals started low. And it was over 90% of the way he fit. And what percentage of people left the practice happy wearing long periods of time without any real complications? And this was with PMF lenses. And the answer was, it was quite high, over 70%, if he could get the lenses through this process to ride high. Well, I thought to myself, that's interesting. Why don't we design a system to get them to ride high in the beginning? Because that's where they ride up. So, so that's sort of by observation and by default. So those are the, it's hard to just visualize that we did things uh, in such a observational, reactive mode rather than thinking prospectively. How are we going to attack this problem with the basis of knowledge that we have? But that's how, after 10 or 20 years of that, we became more proficient than we moved forward. Well, and so you were really at the early end, if you will, or the early time of being able to make those observations, and you were meticulous enough to make those observations and to, and to pay attention to because colleagues across the country were seeing those same things, they just didn't have it figured out as to why it was working. So. Well, I would, I would, I would comment that most of us go through life we don't study everything to death. And the psychiatrist's offices are full of those who study everything to death. <laughs> the only advantage that I have is that I really never needed a psychiatrist because I've kept myself so busy that I don't have time to see the psychiatrist. <laughs> so who were the early influencers in your life? And who were the early influencers in your career? Well, you know, everybody always has a, a, a favorite high school teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> like Michael Harrison, a great professor, has had, had a great I think she was a kindergarten teacher, a very early teacher. And uh, my early teachers were not great influences in my life because they didn't like me. <laughs> in order to get rid of me, they kept promoting me. It would have been okay <laughs> if they promoted me at the end of the year, but they thought, after they met me for two or three weeks, they'd just promote me anyway and get rid of me. So that didn't help the process at all because I became, uh, I was up too high in the class and I was too young, which led to more unhappiness, as you can imagine. But I did, in high school, have, have a wonderful teacher who uh, told me that my forte should be English because I loved English and I loved writing. And uh, that was great until I took my college boards and they called me, and in those days you didn't get your marks. We didn't get our marks, but you were called, and, and I was told that that I did very well in mathematics, uh, and that my my mathematics was high enough so that I didn't have to take it again. I, I really did very very well, which is a family characteristic. Uh, but that my English was obviously they didn't learn, and although I did well, that's not an area that I should. So, so this wonderful high school teacher, uh, uh, I never did follow his, his, his advice. So I staggered off from him. I think that's probably how it happened. And in influencers in career? Uh, well, my career was such that uh, I was considering medicine. I come from a family that has a lot of physicians, including my sister. Uh, my brother was accepted to medical school, but thought physicians were rather uh, mundane characters, not very bright or intelligent, so he went off in theoretical physics. Um, but when I contemplated being a physician, I really didn't like the idea uh, for many reasons. My mother decided in a moment of clarity that, that I should be an optometrist because she knew several optometrists who seemed very happy and did very well. <coughs> and I thought, well, uh, we'll just go, go to optometry school and 
keep everybody happy and live a long <laughs> life. And maybe something good would happen to me along the way. So that's what it was. That's good. And with all the research you've done, it's I note that you, you have done all that without the benefit of an advanced degree, either a master's or a PhD. Um, understanding we have a lot of graduate students in the room and people with some of those degrees, keeping that in mind. Um, <laughs> is there a reason that you didn't pursue an advanced degree and have you regretted that at all? Well, I did pursue several advanced degrees actually and I left uh, because uh, I really learned what I had wanted to learn. But I would encourage anyone the lesson that I've learned in life is that if your goal is to read a classical Greek Bible in Byzantine Greek, then not knowing Byzantine Greek is a severe disadvantage. And if someone gave you a dictionary of Byzantine Greek for a present, that probably would never allow you to understand what the Greek Bible is all about. So the one regret that I have is I don't have a, a broad base of knowledge that I would like to have. And I've had to patch that up as I've gone through the years, for instance, statistics. I never had some real statistics uh, in college or in autonomy school. Uh, so I went and I took a course in statistics. And do I know statistics as if I had a degree? Well, no. I'm reminded of that whenever I meet with Carolyn Blackie. Some of you may know who has a couple degrees in clinical statistics and biostatistics. But I think perhaps that's why I learned to collaborate very, very early. And I also was exposed very early uh, to Dr. Edmund Land, LMD, who was the, uh, was the great genius who founded the Polaroid Corporation. And I've had a, uh, the opportunity throughout the years. I was there for a number of years, head of a project, and for a while I sort of made a lot of the decisions about where the program of photography went up in dentistry, and had a lot of experience in, in helping and directing the, the individual dentists who were developing that technology. But being in that environment, we very quickly learned that most things were a matter of perseverance. You had to have a basic amount of knowledge, but then once you had that knowledge, you could actually, if you made the correct observation, somehow uh, get it done. But if I had to do it over again, I think I would probably do what uh, Dr. Black in my office has done, and that is some clinical terms, his degrees, and in statistics and biostatistics, she has a, a PhD from Cornell in a form of neurology, which is certainly a great area to have for general knowledge. Uh, and then when she came with me uh, for sort of a last year, but really an internship, she spent several days a week with me. I found her out and she did one day a week with one of the best glaucoma people in Boston, his chief of the department, one day a week retina people and she did all of his drawings and he spends half his time in research and half his time uh, in practice and the other individual is corner. So following that model for a clinician, if I had to do it again, I would uh, take the formal programs in the areas that I thought would be essential. And one of the areas uh, that, um, that I've worked in for a long period of time where I'm very deficient knowledge-wise is chemistry. And chemistry is just the base root of everything. And, and all the lipid work that I've done, uh, I've had to sort of learn that. But you can never really learn it out of context. You can't take course 104. And, and your postdoc, if you've never been through course 101, really. And so a lot of the areas that I've worked in, I've never had course 101. But somehow or another, I managed to patch together enough so that I could understand that enough working with other people to, to accomplish the end goal. 
So if it wasn't optometry that it ended up being your profession, what direction do you think you would have gone? No idea. <laughs> I often fantasize womanizing would have been. <laughs> <laughs> Might not have led to as long a marriage as you've had, but for <laughs> fun while it lasted, I mean. Well, I don't know about that either. My experience, my experience was to get out of the field very quickly. <laughs> What do you? Uh, what would you point to as your most uh, significant or most lasting contribution to the field thus far? Gee, you ask a difficult question. I, we want to know. We want to know. Gee, I'd like to know too, but, <laughs> but I don't like to do it extemporaneously. Um, you know, the question that I would always sort of laugh and joke about was individuals who were with me. Uh, I'm collaborative research and some of them were like fellows and some of them were colleagues. Others were mentors or partners. Was the question was, is this really going to matter how we this? And I think you I think you really either have to be a very, very egotistical to ask that question, or perhaps uh, very focused. And I think that most people who work with me after a period of time will react, don't ask me that again. I don't want to hear that question again. I just want to know is it going to matter tomorrow so I won't get fired. And, and I can see that. But when you think of so much of our work, so much of our work doesn't really seek the root cause of anything, nor does it really, nor will it be here very long, be quickly outmoded by technology. So if I look at some of the things that I thought which were really good in discovering, even this phenomenon of central coin of clouding, well, that was, that was, that was really, really pretty amazing as I look back, of how I was fortunate enough to have Read as a hobby, but then went by a microscopy of the eye. I just went through that for two years, and I read every page on it several times. So I just understand what the world's best biomicroscopist saw, so at least I could be conversant in it. And I thought well, maybe there would be some knowledge uh, from that. And when I think back of how I took that knowledge with some of the methods of illumination that I learned in my days at Polaroid, and I sort of one day epitome and I, I just was able to put it together and figure out, my goodness gracious, I want to illuminate the cornea absolutely evenly. How do you illuminate the entire cornea evenly from limbus to limbus, from 3, from three o'clock to 9 o'clock and from 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock, so that you get a 6, 7, 8, 9 millimeter area of the cornea totally uh, evenly illuminated in a real homogeneous manner, so anything that was there would then stick out and people would jump out of it. Well, uh, we were discussing a little bit about that today with, with one of the graduate students and, and, and with Dr. Barr. And, you know, it's 40 years later or whatever, and it's gone. It's just gone. It was something for the time. It led to something. And that observation did lead to rigid gas in the lenses ultimately. Once you define the problem, you had a metric and you could move forward. But I think that there are certain areas that will be here 100 years from now. And I think that if you concentrate on basic physiological phenomena, that they will be here 100 years from now, or 200 years from now, or 500 years from now. So the phenomenon of GPC, whether it's induced by contact lens, or whether it's induced by sutures, or whether it's induced by an irregular corneal surface, that will be here. That isn't going to go away. That was here before we named it. That was here before we were able to classify it as a distinct entity. Uh, so that will be here. Um, and that is interesting. But I truly believe that the real luck that I had in in being able to really, quote, discover the type of, I'm really discovering my bony gland dysfunction, not to be egotistical, but just being factual, 
as, composed, as compared to mybomitis, as compared to infective super, uh, uh, in, in compared to all the various forms of, of meibomian gland dysfunction uh, that were described. They were really severe medical outliers, as Chalet's Chalazin, for instance, uh, is one of them, and just chronic myomitis, constant inflammation, possibly with infection. Uh, but to be able to define the fact that you can have a gland which is not functioning properly, and that that gland in turn starts an entire cascade, and now knowing clearly, defined by the world's best people, that myomian gland dysfunction, and I didn't invent the word myboma, and that was by Dr. Mybom some 550 years ago. Nor did I invent the word uh, dysfunction, nor did I invent the word clean, but I was the person who put them in that order. And for a purpose, the purpose <coughs> being to distinguish it from the terms used by our medical colleagues in their medical practice. So I think that NGD will probably be will probably be the best thing I've ever known, because I'm certain that not only will that be here, uh, as long as Homo sapiens is here, but more importantly, I think that every year we have more and more NGD, because we deviate further and further from the anthropological model of what man is supposed to do, and how man does do it, and how we use our ocular system, and the severe consequences we pay for violating the, uh, the very clever design of the whole interior segment of the eye and its method of preservation. So I think that that whole concept, and this will change the face of autonomy, it will change the face of eye care practice, because we'll be, we'll be practicing preventive care, we'll be practicing to prevent, quotes, dry eye, end quotes, whatever that is. We'll be taking a look at two simple things, structure and function. And if I could come back here 10 years from now and we were to talk to graduate students, they will be talking about structure and function and what the consequences are with the sequela eye and what the cascade uh, and all of its implications are that that, that lack of structure and function uh, results in. So I would think that. That it's very, very complicated even to try to discuss it briefly because you have to really get the time to go through it sequentially to see it. But in my mind, when the die is cast, and just like contact lenses change the face, uh, not only of, of many of the areas that all I care practitioners practice in, but contact lenses were the inciting factor that probably drove laser and they drove all these other ideas. Because once we understood that you could modify the corneal shape, either with the prosthesis or by perhaps altering the cornea itself, then you have this, you, you have this entire uh, incited sequelae of activity from that basic idea across the broad spectrum of everybody who's working on research. Very good. Is there a research question you want to answer before your research career ends? Yeah, there's many of them. I, uh, I once gave, I think I, at, at Berkeley, I gave a lecture and I listed uh, 20 research questions that I would never get to uh, that should be answered. So the problem is in research, if you really want to answer a question, uh, it's a long process. And the lecture that I'll be talking about uses the term odyssey. And I've looked up the term odyssey, and I just looked it up today when Dr. Bar was driving, just to be sure that I that I had it straight, that I haven't forgotten what an odyssey is. And it's a long journey. It's a long journey. It's a journey with its ups and downs and all of the cyclical fact. And if you're very fortunate, it ends with some level of success. Or if you're lucky enough to be here to talk about it. If you're not lucky enough, it ended in the sea or somewhere else, <laughs> and you've been unsuccessful. 
But I think that almost every research project ends up being an odyssey. And I think if the individual who's doing it is passionate about it, has a real desire to do it, um, and is really, and I look around the room and I see Jeff Wallin and I see Don Muti and I see so many people who have that passion, Carl, uh, who have the passion to get in a certain area uh, and you just want to, want to do it. Uh, the one area that I'm now violently interested in, passionately interested in, is simplicity. Because I've always remembered the words of Pavlov when he said that uh, the complex can always, uh, the simple can always be understood without the complex, but the complex can never be understood without the simple. So I just have, I've just done so, so much work. I probably have 40 or 50 unpublished manuscripts in the past seven or eight years, all of which would be valuable, of which will never get written. Most of them will never see the light of day. Some have been presented as posters, so hopefully that will stimulate others to do the work and, and, and publish them and happy just to help them in any way. But I think that uh, it's just so important to make things simple because we're living in a world where time is of the essence. If we want better clinical methods, they can't be long or they have to be short. Uh, we have to recognize that we need equipment to do the job. And we have to recognize that unless we want to practice palliative medicine, uh, then we have to understand the root cause. So we simultaneously have a demand, really, if we're honest and conscientious, to seek out the root cause. But seeking out the root cause is much more difficult and time consuming than practicing palliative, but yet that's what we should be doing. So in order to do that, we have to harness technology, we have to have top technology provide us with many of the answers. But technology really can't provide us with anything unless we direct technology to provide us with that. So I think that the challenge is really to take what we know in technology, the work that many of us have done, and then try to translate it, but make it simple, really, really try to make it simple, and it may not be foolproof, but at least to understand the root causes of a lot of the problems that we face. How do we test efficiently and quickly for them, for it, and how do we then separate those who uh, are solved 100% by that particular approach from those who are not. Tell us a little bit about your wife, Joan Exford. Just one of the most amazing people ever. She really is. She's really amazing. She's a, a, a little dynamo who's extremely modest. She's been responsible for so much of my success. She uh, was in research with me in the beginning. Uh, then we had children, and as the children became more demanding, her research would drop. Uh, she's made great observations. She's been very active politically, but to her it's not political. It's just helping people. Uh, she really doesn't she isn't impressed with herself, and she isn't impressed with the political life. Uh, she, uh, she sort of started on a PhD program, was, was accepted for it, but uh, the individual uh, with whom she was embarking on that odyssey or journey uh, elected uh, not to take that journey. And it's a good thing that he did not because I married Joan, so I'm very grateful that he did. But she just is, uh, she's just really almost unique. And she doesn't think that she helps many people, but I can just name a host of things that she started. Uh, she started and mentored and paid for the entire the first program of this in uh, autonomy students to the academy. It was many, many, many years ago. And for years she ran a party uh, when she had to celebrate that at her house, uh, where she invited the world. Uh, and, uh, and then she became more selective. She realized that the vitamin the world was great, but a lot of homeless people and people with nothing better to do were happy to come and be warm and march uh, and to have your drinks and to have your food. So then she said, well, we should contribute a little money to the students. So she raised money and she would send two, three, four people a year uh, to the academy. So she really has, has done a lot across the, across the broad spectrum of <clears throat> any life lessons about anything that you'd want to share with our with our audience and with our viewers? Gee, I'm not much of uh, 
I really don't have that that skills. I would only think that uh, I can only say that if you're really passionate about something, if you really enjoy something, uh, that that is what you should do. Because my observations have been that, that those who really are not passionate about what they do uh, are not as happy uh, as those who are passionate. And it may not be in our profession, it may be passionate about something else. But I think that, that really liking and really having an inherent motivation to work in a certain area is, is perhaps what I would advocate to anyone as a recipe for life. I think that's wise counsel. If you could redo something in your life, what would it be? I would probably have worked more folk. I would probably have been more focused. I would probably uh, have managed my time much better in the areas that I am. <clears throat> and I would probably, uh, I think the first thing I would do is I would publish. I would make a rule which is totally against my persona. You know, I suffer from the reversion syndrome. So, so when I'm walking along, if I see something that's more attractive than what I'm doing, I just forget that and I jump to that. I mean, it's just so much fun. And what that has led to is uh, a lot of unpublished work that would be valuable to society. Uh, so I would think that that probably would be my, my greatest regret. But a lot of the best things that I've ever done have never been, have never been published. And, and they're just like a cloud. Someone, one of my members just said, well, if I could give you any advice, it would be not to think about clouds. And I said, well, why shouldn't I think about clouds? And he said, because you're like a cloud. And I said, I'm like a cloud? Well, that's unique. Tell me. And he said, well, if you just think about a cloud, a cloud can be exciting, a cloud can be beautiful, a cloud can have a lot of qualities that are interesting, but it just passes by and it never comes back and it's lost. And you don't even take a photograph of it to show me. So I would think that 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 would be that would be very valid criticism. So I think if I could correct anything, I would I would work on that. If there were, and what do you wish you could, as you look over your life, what do you wish you had done less of in life? Less of. I would think I. If I really could, uh, if I really would answer that question honestly and practice full disclosure, assuming that, that I can think of the full disclosure extemporaneously, I would think that uh, not 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 having the wisdom, not having the wisdom to to really differentiate between what I was capable of doing and what was very, very, very important and what was not. I think that's something that, that I probably have achieved a very good mark at, meaning uh, an honor grade. I could probably, maybe I wouldn't get some of at it, but I get at least a cum in that area. I'm pretty good at, 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 at that. The reasons, uh, I'm sure, are, are complicated, but but just not really understanding totally your obligation to society, perhaps, to <clears throat> do the most you can to repay society for the wonderful privilege that we all have of being in a country where nobody's torturing us, where if you work hard enough and you're not victimized by your early upbringing, uh, you can get educated and you can have very wonderful career. So I think that looking at the negative uh, and not looking at the positive all the time is probably something that uh, is within all of us. But I think I probably, as I say, wish that there were more positive on me uh, than there has been. And I would spend less time thinking negatively and forging forward positively and just ignoring everything. Just, doesn't, just to say, it really doesn't exist. The negative really doesn't exist. This is positive, and uh, 
Every day is a great day. It really is. Some days are greater than others, of course, but that's okay. But just, but just to have that, just to have that attitude, how fortunate we are to be in a society that allows us to to do what we're talking about today. And the last question you may have already slipped in answering, and that is, what do you wish you had done more of in your life? Last question I have. These folks may have some questions. But... Boy. Um, I'm not a religious person, but I'll just share with you an experience that I had earlier this week. Uh, I went to a funeral, and uh, the individual passed away had had a very unfortunate life and died very young, uh, before 50. Uh, and the service was a graveside service conducted by uh, a very liberal Jewish rabbi. And you can understand how liberal he was by the fact that uh, in a conversation that I was listening to that he had with several these researchers and physicians. Uh, and when he was asked some of his religious beliefs, he wouldn't tell them what his religious beliefs are, but he said some of the best rabbis in the world are atheists, which was interesting. I'm not, I'm not passing judgment on it, I'm just making a statement. But he was a very wise man who could see that immediately. He had this, this, this persona and this method of talking uh, that that was honest and, and to the point. And he said that, uh, that, uh, that everyone should basically be involved with uh, doing something good every day, really doing something good every day. And he said some people can do good merely by, by doing what they can do because they don't have the resources, they don't have the knowledge, and they don't have the skills. But for other individuals who are fortunate enough to be educated and to be at a much, much higher level, uh, they perhaps forget that. And they forget relating to their fellow human beings uh, on a basis that would be helpful. Uh, and as he said, it can be adequate, but it's really not exemplary. It's really not optimal. So the counsel that he had that I took away from it because it applies to me, is perhaps every day I haven't worked hard enough with anybody with whom I come in contact to do what, to do what this wonderful man said is really our obligation because of how fortunate we are to be where we are in this country and in this society with all the opportunities that we have. Wise counsel. It was wise counsel. I remember it. We'd like to open up the uh, discussion for questions from the audience and uh, anyone who might have questions. Dr. Moody? I didn't know that you worked for land. What was, uh, what was your work in that position? Oh, um, I had an idea that uh, in order for the contact lens, you had a nose of corneal topography. And land made infrared film. It was uh, Polaroid made infrared film. And they made it in lantern slide size. Mm -hmm. So I went with a proposal to develop a rotating camera which could photograph the corneal profile with infrared, which we could do. And we learned some amazing things which again weren't published. For instance, in the anthropological development of man, when you look at these profile photographs just with your naked eye, you can see that the and you can see this with your naked eye just by having somebody look up and observing, that the nasal limbus is forward from the temporal limbus. And I was never taught that in school, nor, nor have I ever met anyone who expounded that or taught that with all the contact lens work. And for years I would talk about it and you know, I finally gave up because no one was interested in it. But that's the reason why the nasal portion of the ocular surface drives the fantastic. 
So we developed some great, great, great data. The only problem was that there was no computer, which was fast enough in those days, to take the information and make it into, uh, to make it useful. However, in going back, Joe, to some of the, what we were talking about in binding of lenses, we would go ahead and we would make a profile uh, by panographic tracing at 50x, so it would be like six or seven feet large, and we would take the whole corneal profile in uh, uh, vertical, horizontal, and two obliques, and we would then create a plastic cast of the entire corneal surface. And then, by a reverse panographic model, we take it down to its original size. And we then make a mold of that, and we then take that to William Polikoff at 64 South Franklin Street in Wilkes Barre, Pennsylvania. And Bill would make a skull contact lens for us. And when you put those on the eye and check them with fluorescent, boy, they fit beautifully. <laughs> but they didn't work because they just sucked on the coin. So, uh, so that's how I first became involved, and then uh, I got to know a lot of the scientists there, some of whom I still work with. Did you learn business from Land? I mean, that was sort of my follow-up question: Is you, you've shown a lot of business acumen in your in your career? Where, what do you attribute that to? Well, I attribute very simply, uh, and I was thinking about that actually. Uh, I think I might have been talking to Joe about it earlier, riding in from the airport. Um, if you're hungry, you figure out a way to eat, if you're smart. Or if you have adequate brains, you get a job, you do something. You don't usually starve if there's an alternative. And uh, if you want money for research, you have, you have only uh, one choice. Uh, you have to raise it if you don't have it. You have to have it. So I found out very early in my life that you had to have somebody to sponsor you. Polaroid was my first sponsor, and he sponsored a lab for me, and, and I did all his work, and it was great work, but unfortunately, it didn't have any commercial use. But I didn't lose my house, and I didn't lose my life savings on it. Somebody else lost money, and they, they were used to losing money. So the companies that I founded or became involved with were founded because those were the best sources of, of funding that you could have. And nobody will give you money in us capitalistic society unless there's some or large sums of money, or reasonable sums of money, unless there's some structure that offers them the hope of ultimately seeing a return of the capital. So uh, I actually don't have any business sense. I'm a very poor businessman and I really don't care about it. The moment I have enough money to do what I want to do, I just forget it. And uh, I don't plan prospectively, I act, I act retrospectively. But I survive. <laughs> Others? You've met lots of fascinating people over your career. Who, who would you say were the one or two or three most fascinating people in optometry that you've met? They were in optometry. Or anyone. Uh, or, uh, one of the gentlemen who comes to mind is a man named Ivan Mikievich. And he's a, uh, a Croatian who came to this country and did his postdoc at Yale. And then he was lucky enough to stay and went up to Clarkson. He became the world's expert in. Uh, uh, in colloids, and colloid methods of spreading colloids, uh, and he's just a fascinating, just a fascinating person who epitomizes the whole concept of how grateful people can be for being here and having the opportunities that they have. And I don't know if he trained. He has seven, eight hundred publications. He, uh, uh, you know party that he had uh, to celebrate his 50th year at Clarkson a few years ago. Uh, because I worked with him for so many years and he was sort of a mentor of mine, 
Joan and I were invited, and he deliberately positioned me between two Nobel Prize laureates. And uh, I don't know, I mean, that, was, that was quite an experience. They're both very nice people. One of his name was Richard Smith, who won the Nobel Prize in physics from Switzerland. Uh, but Matijevic had the ability to really collaborate with so many, so many people across the world. And brought all these European scientists, great scientists, to a little class and purchased a powerhouse of chemistry department and probably trained at least 100 PhDs or maybe more than a couple hundred master's degrees. But his one, uh, uh, now that you've got me talking, uh, his one requirement was that he always taught freshman chemistry. Always taught freshman chemistry. And there was another gentleman uh, who uh, was Dwight Kavanaugh's mentor, uh, uh, George Walt at Harvard, who won two Nobel Prizes himself one for the Dobson, of course, and one for, uh, uh, and went for peace. And, uh, and he was just amazing. And I was privileged to be in his lab a bit fitting contact lenses for some of his experiments, so I had the opportunity many nights to be there. And he had exactly the same requirement from, as Matijevich. And Matijevich is well thought about so that uh, the American Chemical Society has a whole day name for him. I think, my goodness, I got the chance to work with him all those years. Just, just, just really in prejudice. Uh, so, I think there's just uh, just so many, just so many incredulous people who are interested in what we do and will collaborate. And probably the reason that I haven't had as intimate a relationship with many OTs as I had with people who are outside the field is because I think it's much easier for people outside the field to collaborate with somebody because it is. French philosopher once said that a relatively small idea and a basic part of everyday practice in one field when transplanted to another field has remarkable results. It really just just takes off. So I think it's much easier to develop relationships with people outside because there's no competition, there's, there's no suspicion, and it's just you're not competing. Although I've never felt like I'm competing with anyone, I just, I, do. I just do what I want to do. Because I don't have to worry about promotions, I don't have to be involved in the academic uh, arena. So I don't know whether that answers your question. No. One of the things that you had mentioned to me on the phone was why they taught freshman chemistry, which I thought was a very inspirational point. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, both of them said, if I, if, uh, at Clarkson, for instance, anyone with a science degree must take freshman chemistry. And Clarkson's known for its engineering. So there'd be probably three, four hundred people who had to take freshman chemistry every year. And at Harvard, there was five or six hundred in the class. And then they broke it up into the workstations, but there'd be one lecture to five hundred people. And both of them, interestingly, and uh, uh, both of them, had the attitude that if they could just convert it out of that mass of students in front of them, several people to be, in quotes, passionate about chemistry, to really become passionate, to make them passionate about it, then that was the most important thing that they could do. And that's what they derived the most pleasure from. So thank you. That, that, that is, and that ties in with the whole concept of passion, that, that they considered that, that so vital and so important. Other questions? I thought Buckeye Bob had one. Well, I, I do, but it's a, in a different vein. Uh, Don, my contact lens instructor was Neil Bailey. And I wonder if you had any funny uh, recollections of him over the years, because you obviously were an expert in contact lenses in Boston, as he was here in Columbus. And he was, he was just one of our distinguished alumni. And I wonder if you remember 
any conversations with him over the years? Yeah, vividly, many, many, many. <clears throat> Neil, of course, uh, uh, was very bright and he was very knowledgeable. And he, uh, he probably was, uh, he probably was the master of caustic humor. Uh, he probably would be a candidate for a Nobel Prize in that area. He was really <laughs> good. He was really good. Uh, so whenever you were on a stage with him, uh, or whenever uh, you were with Neil, uh, he had a, a great facility for teaching by ridicule. And he enjoyed it. I mean, it was, it was, it was enjoyable to him. He really enjoyed it. Uh, in my younger days, uh, uh, as I say, you ask me what I regret. Well, in my younger days, I would tend to be adversarial. And I enjoyed being adversarial. It was kind of fun, and it was a good match, and it was an exercise of your intellect. So whenever Neil and I would be together, uh, there would be some very good exchanges. And I will always remember we were on a platform together, and I lectured on fenestrating lenses because I became quite proficient at fence trading lenses uh, in order to get oxygen through a PMMA lens uh, and through scleral lenses. So, uh, and Neil was on lecturing about something else. I forget what Neil was lecturing about. And there was a discussion period. And there were questions and answers from the audience and there were five or six of us sitting up in the panel. So someone asked me a a question as to whether or not fenestrations really, really, really solve the demon. So I said, well, I just presented that. And do you remember the slide where I showed that you could have an area of central corneal cloud, and if you put fenestrations in it and the lens didn't rotate because you put a prism in it, you could carve out a hole of transparency in the areas of central corneal clavicle. So you have a six millimeter circle that is white and opaque. And if you had three holes in it, we'd have three little half millimeter zones of absolute clarity. So I responded to the, and I was very nice to the person who asked the question. I wasn't sarcastic at all. And I said, well, you know, I'm sorry that I didn't present it better. And I probably didn't present it well enough for him to understand it. Um, and I said, that's why we put the holes in. The experiment showed that we can, if we put menstruations in, dramatically improve oxygen to various areas of the cornea. And then if we take and we put a goggle on top of it, and we wait a couple hours, the holes go away, even though the lens is in place because we've dropped the oxygen supply of the driving pressure at the face. I've even forgotten the words so long ago. To drive an oxygen force at the at the at the corneal surface. So Neil is sitting there, and so I'm explaining just as I'm finished. He says, "Well, are you done, Donald?" I said, "Yeah, I'm done." Neil. He said, "Well, I'd like to comment and say that you would get a lot better success if you put a 10 millimeter fenestration in a 9 millimeter lens." <laughs> <laughs> and that was tough to get. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Well, Dr. Thorpe, I think we've come to the end of our time for our, lecture, for our interview today. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. We thank you for being here, and uh, thanks for playing along and uh, answering our questions uh, for our audience. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some of these people may have questions they want to ask privately as well, so we'll let them do that as well. It'd be a pleasure. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.